Fires burn in the city and windows are smashed. Garda Commissioner Drew Harris blames the damage on a complete lunatic faction driven by far-right ideology. Far-right, just so we're clear. He would say that, wouldn't he? Irish Justice Minister Helen McEntee looked at the fires and said, a thuggish and manipulative element must not be allowed to use an appalling tragedy to wreak havoc. A manipulative element wreaking havoc. Oh, the irony. A violent act, an angry reaction, and the only actors authority wants to talk about, to condemn and to initiate action against are those lighting fires. The only possible explanation for such a reaction to the stabbing of children, they must be lunatics of the far right. Already legislation is rushed through the Irish Parliament to enable more state surveillance of the populace, more state control of so-called hate speech. Do you see the playbook yet? How or why could any sentient being miss it? A person would have to wonder if there's just one copy of the playbook, dog-eared after its ceaseless use by London's Metropolitan Police and perhaps reluctantly shared, or whether multiple copies circulate freely, with far right underlined on every page. Children bleed and parents weep. Protesters take to the streets and politicians and legislators and those they serve, which is not us, patiently reel in the line, knowing the hook is swallowed deep, the barb fixed fast. It's so very hard to resist, after all, the relentless push to hate and to fear. For decades, something deliberately disruptive has been forced on the people of the West. There's no denying it. Mass immigration. People from all over the world have been thrust together virtually overnight and without any sort of foreplay. Before the turn of the century, new Labour were apparently glorying in the thought of rubbing our noses in diversity. It ought never to have happened this way, but it was made to happen this way, and for a reason, by those fear-filled, cowardly authoritarians desperate for the controls they think will save them from the rest of us. What's been done in Europe, done to Europe these years past, has been less advisable than speed dating in the dark with drunk people. And so you get what we've got. Marry in haste, repent at leisure. Not even the most basic due diligence either, so that along with all the decent human beings has come some of all the trouble in the world. And so, by these means, have people been made to hate other people, people they don't know, while all their hate ought properly to be reserved and somehow focused on those they do know, those deserving of being on the receiving end of such destructive emotion. Familiar faces all, cynically stoking the anti-human hatred in pursuit of their master's ends. I have people I love, among them Christians, Jews, Muslims and others besides, or if you prefer, Westerners, Israelis and Arabs. They're my friends. I won't hate on command. Everyone I love hates the hate as well. I won't hate on command and certainly not on behalf of those who line their pockets and secure their positions by stoking that hatred. And so millions of people have deliberately been made afraid and angry. While all that's going on, a former British Prime Minister, yet another from a grisly cast of characters, each at the head of his own column of countless dead civilians in countless countries, this time the Right Honourable Sir Tony Blair, renews his old calls for the introduction of digital IDs to solve the problems of all that immigration. Tony Blair and his ilk want you frightened and filled with hate. Then you'll beg for the solution they offer, which is slavery for you and freedom for them. Unflushable, apparently, digital IDs and Tony Blair both. Blair has done as much as any of the rest of the club of international ghouls to destabilise the Middle East and to sow the very unrest that sees tides of people rise and walk away from wherever they were born in search of anything else, anywhere else. If your home and everyone else's home for miles around had been bombed flat, what would you do? Where would you go? All over the West, frightened, angry people, overwhelmed by changes to their lives and communities, they feel powerless to influence, are automatically abused by being labelled with names chosen to make them feel isolated, vulnerable, lunatics, far right. All over the world, frightened, angry people are also overwhelmed by fast-moving changes. They feel powerless to influence. One war after another ensures those already on edge stay on edge, while simultaneously being told, ordered, what to think about what they see. Millions of people of every creed and colour marched through cities all over the world demanding a ceasefire in Gaza and were abused in line with the same old playbook. They're labelled as you'd expect, not pro-peace, just anti-this or anti-that. In truth, people of every creed and colour all over the world are only made to feel powerless, denied any sense of their real power by those who work tirelessly to make the mass of the population feel powerless and therefore dependent at all times for their safety and well-being on those above them in the food chain. 
Out of sight of most, that thin sliver of powerful people displays a level of cynicism that's beyond the comprehension of decent folk. Nothing is off-limits to ensure the objectives of those who would do away with nation-states and the freedom of populations, not even children, anyone and everyone's children. Children are exploited like tinder to keep the heat under unrest, to keep as many people as possible distracted by hatred and suspicion of each other, of their neighbours, rather than focusing fury where it belongs, on the ghouls that keep stirring the pot, stoking the fires. And in among it all, what is the word on every authoritarian's lips? Why, democracy, of course. As soon as people, any people, start realising and manifesting their power in any way, those in charge prick up their ears. Democracy in the West is like the toy steering wheel a parent fixes to the dashboard of a car to entertain a toddler, making it think it's steering the car, when of course it isn't. Whenever people find a way to get their feet on the actual pedals, if only momentarily, their hands on the actual wheel, those in power act quickly to correct any possibility of a change of direction. Look at recent moments when the people grabbed the wheel. The election of Donald Trump in 2016, the vote for Brexit here in the UK the same year. In 2019, people gave the Tories an 80-seat majority, the collapse of the Red Wall and all that jazz. But again, it brought only swift retribution, just like the Trump presidency and Brexit brought swift retribution. I've wondered at the coincidence of the pandemic and everything else since 2020, and wondered if it wasn't all the punishment beating meted out to an upstart populace that dared to grab the wheel. Democracy in the West has been made a fraud and a confidence trick, a cut and shut used car, a chocolate teapot, an ashtray on a motorbike, snake oil for the gullible. For as long as the present incumbents hold sway, the face men and women of the crime syndicates really running the show, then any notion of democracy, the so-called rule of the people, is what we call in Scotland a busted flush. Too few people are angry with the right people, and by the right people, I mean the wrong ones, that interconnected, interdependent lot that always crops up, spiders on webs. The many of us are goaded and atomised, split by chaos into smaller and smaller, mutually loathing and mutually suspicious factions, while the same few get richer, laughing at us behind our backs on the way to the bank. They have an emergent and growing problem, however, those few. The pesky people are grasping at the wheel again. In the Netherlands, the latest election has given prominence and significance to the PVV, the Party for Freedom, led by Geert Wilders, routinely and loudly dismissed as far-right and extremist. At the other end of the world, in Argentina, the president-elect is Javier Mille, economist and author, and another labelled right-wing and populist. Populists of the people. How dare the people have what they want? Supine journalists obediently squeak the populist word. What they really mean is lump and scum, casting such politicians and their supporters into Hillary Clinton's basket of deplorables. Implicit in that deliberate corruption of the meaning of populist, explicit if you're awake, is that we, the people, are the problem. The demos are the problem. Which means that for the uniparties, the hybrid Democrat and Republican Party in the US, the hybrid Conservative and Labour Party in the UK, democracy itself, what remains of democracy, is the problem. Trump's a Republican in name only, a loner given independence by his billions. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is another, an outsider with an insider's surname. And yet, in the race for the White House, Trump and Kennedy are the front runners, apparently beyond the control of the swamp. Vivek Ramaswamy is apparently outside the tent too, or at least as far as anyone can tell. Even if all of the above are really double agents, the very idea of outsiders is almost spice enough for jaded palates in these decades of bland automatons handed power as if by right in, returning, in return for allowing themselves to be compromised enough so they'll hold out their hands for whatever they're given by those really in charge. The intention is to drive us off the cliff. With that in mind, does anyone really think they'll let the people into the driving seat? Surely what we face is more censorship, more shutting down, more fracturing of society, more atomization. When democracy itself is demonstrably the last obstacle in the path of the authoritarians, flimsy, hollowed out, shadow of a thing that it is, what is the future of elections? Even if they happen, courtesy of the uniparty bending the knee to unelected, unaccountable entities like the World Health Organization and the World Economic Forum, how can the results even matter? Here's the thing, while wars rage and people are made to hate, too many are blind to the real enemy. Joining me tonight is academic and emeritus professor of sociology, Frank Ferredi. Frank, 
What is populism? And how has it become a pejorative? Well, populism simply means um, giving voice to the aspiration of the people. And historically, populist and populist movements were able to somehow capture the, the emotions and the sensibilities that uh, people really care about. And because it's a grassroots movement, and because it very often threatens the powers that be, it has become increasingly seen as a threat. And the moment it's seen as a threat, then basically everything is done to create a playbook whereby the populists, or people who see themselves as populists, are framed in such a way as to demonize and criminalize them. But when you look around, I think the really important thing is, is that for better or worse, despite all the setbacks that we've suffered, there are groups, political movements all over Europe who are kicking back. I mean, I've been traveling up and down Europe recently, and you go to France, you go to Italy, you go to Holland and Belgium, and there are a minority of, of people who have formed political parties who are, uh, in a sense, demanding to be heard. And I mean, we're living in a very special moment because the mainstream parties understand that they can no longer take for granted that they're running the show. And that's why it's so dangerous at the moment in terms of the future. Is there any, anything ideologically in common between those disparate groups across Europe? Or, or, or are they all populist in their own contexts for their own reasons? You raise a very important problem, which is that what well, we have are people who have been moved to react to their circumstance. Basically, people who, who argue that they want to be part of the conversation. They want to be taken seriously. That's what they're saying. But at the moment, what's really lacking is a political ideology, or at least a, a, a sense of a, of a political direction which could give that positive energy that, that is there a, a, a real direction. So therefore, you have a situation where all over Europe, people are, are mobilizing, they're organizing. They don't even call themselves populists. They have all kinds of names that they've adopted. But what they have, the one thing that they have in common is solidarity, the aspiration for solidarity, that we really belong to a community. And the other thing that they have in common is that they're demanding to be heard. And that's a very positive development, because you cannot have democracy until people find their voice. Is there anything unprecedented about what's happening at the moment? And presumably, there have always been people who have uh, reflected or given voice to the people. But is there something different happening now? I think there's one big difference, which is that for the first time since the Second World War, the mainstream political parties, Christian democracy in Italy, social democracy, labor here, the conservative parties, all these parties have lost their legitimacy. If you look at these parties there, they barely have any, have any serious members or activists anymore. These are zombie parties that are able to perpetuate themselves because of their access to power. And because the, the legitimacy has, has been lost by these parties, what you have is a big political vacuum, which uh, creates an opportunity because the political landscape is now far more open than before. And, and the first important blow against the ruling elites in Europe was the election of Meloni in Italy, because for better, better or worse, she was labeled as far right, even fascistic. But yet, when you go to Italy, people love her because she speaks their voice. Since that time, we had a, a lot of rebellions in Sweden, in France, in, in, in Holland. Uh, I, I remember going to Holland very recently and talking to the farmers who've been organizing against the attempt to drive them off the land by various environmental NGOs. And they tell me that, you know, we're, we're in this for the long run. We're not going to give up tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. This is our lives, because if we're driven off the land, it isn't just losing a job. It's losing a way of life. And mm -hmm. I think that kind of sentiment is widespread. And I find that extremely inspirational that there are people for the first time doing this. I was speaking to a friend in, in, in the Netherlands, uh, very, very excited and upbeat about what's happened with the PVV, because that's, that's a group and an individual really who was derided and, and, and an outlier until very recently. Yeah. And suddenly one in four Dutch voters have voted for that party and that man. Well, not just one in four, but, you know, usually it's uh, argued that it's the old people that vote for the right or the vote for movements like that. If you look at uh, elect the statistics, the majority of high school students said that they prefer the PVV to any other party. Uh, a disproportionate number of young people mm. voted for this. And also, very importantly, 
unlike anywhere else, like in England or elsewhere, where there's a big urban and rural divide. Uh, in Holland, even people in the big urban areas voted for the PVB because for the first time, uh, they argued they could see that it was, it's necessary. It's, a, it's, a, it's an emergency as far as they're concerned, which has been really exacerbated by the war in Israel because what even a lot of liberal Dutch people are saying, we don't want something that happened to the Israelis to occur in our country. Got to get to a break at the moment, Frank. Thank you for that so far. After the break, veteran anti-Islam populist leader Geert Wilders has won a dramatic victory in the Dutch general election with almost all votes counted. His win has shaken, has shaken Dutch politics and it will send a shock wave across Europe as well. I'll be joined by Ralph Schulhammer, Assistant Professor in Political Science and Economics, to discuss this in more detail. Don't go anywhere. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, is it, is it you? <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's your teeth. It's, I, I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Radio. Welcome back. So what does the Geert Wilders win mean for Europe? My first guest this evening is Ralph Schulhammer, academic and political commentator to contemplate the implications. And Ralph hopefully joins me now down the line. Are you there, Ralph? I am there. Can you hear me, Emil? I can. I could do with a little bit more volume on Ralph if someone can turn Ralph up a little bit. Uh, Ralph, what do you think the result means, uh, the result for the, the, the PVV result means for the imminent future of the Netherlands? Well, I think for the Netherlands, it's probably going to be now a significant number of months where they try to form a government. It is not yet clear if Gerd Wilders will pull off becoming prime minister because he needs the cooperation with at least three to four other parties. But what is really crucial is 
that this is the first time in a Western European country a supposed right-wing populist party came in first after if you can, Italy is slightly different. So as we would say, the dikes have broken. And I think this is the real significant event that is going on here. Do you think what's happened with Wilders and PVV will have uh, consequential impacts elsewhere in Europe? You know, is, does it fire a starting pistol for something else? Oh, yes, absolutely. There is very often a comparison when people talk about Europe, right? It's like the 1920s, the 1930s. But that's an absurd comparison. Geert Wilders is not a fascist. That's entirely ridiculous. But I think what is a good comparison would be 1845, right? 1848 was a big revolutionary year in Europe. And I think Europe has entered pre-revolutionary territory. Now, you have an elite that is unwilling to give up the state. As you said in the introductory remarks, the uniparties, they cling to the status quo. And underneath them, you have all these different movements now that, that pop up. As Dr. Frady said before, right, some of them have different names, they have different ideologies. And you see this now spreading from Eastern Europe to Western Europe. You see it in Dublin, right? You see it in all these different areas. So I think we are in a pre-revolutionary quasi-1848 uh, moment. And it's unclear. Different countries will come to different solutions. There will be different movements. But this uprising against a status quo maintaining elite, I think that is definitely something that's going to spread over the next couple of years. For me, I don't know what you think, but I think it's important, vital to notice, to be aware that what has happened in Europe, it, 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 was, a, it was made to happen. It didn't happen by itself. You know, the sudden influx of people, you know, it's not necessarily the new people's fault you know, they were, they were on, they're on the move as well for reasons beyond their control also. You know, but we, we ought to be mindful to look up for the answers to who made this happen and not to each other. No, I agree. And let's not forget one thing. Let me bring in some optimism into this conversation. The whole point of democracy is that it is anti-status quo. The whole idea that you have the people voicing their opinions, that you have the, the possibility to change the political direction without changing the entire political system, that is the strength of democracy. There is this idea that we all have to vote for Labour or the Tories, or that we have to vote for the Conservatives or Social Democrats. But that's not true. That's not what democracy is about. The very idea of democracy is that if the people are dissatisfied, they can form new movements and they can give their allegiance, and then they either have to deliver or they disappoint. And this is the situation that Herr Wilders will find himself in. So honestly, don't listen to what everybody says. This is a life sign of democracy. I mean, what do you want? Do you want people to have the opportunity to vote for other parties, or do you want them to have the revolution in the street? I mean, I don't think that the latter one is you know, entirely out of, the, out of the possible, but I'd rather have changings on changes at the voting booth and then change that makes life better for the people than to force them to go into the streets. Frank Ferreira, what do you make of that? A lifeline for democracy, that this, that, 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 this idea that, it's a, a, that this is a hopeful sign sh short of bloody flaming revolution? Well, it is. I mean, without a doubt, it's for the first time in my life that I've seen a, a trend crystallising whereby uh, a lot of people that were voiceless beforehand are taking themselves seriously and are organizing and doing stuff. And these are not university educated professors and university educated activists. These are people, ordinary people who've decided that enough is enough. And you know, the thing about democracy that people forget is that when democracy was invented, it was preceded by the development of hatred for democracy, anti-democratic theories preceded democratic theories because the Greek elites hated the demos. And in many ways, you know, the, the, the uh, pathologization of populists actually begins in Greece. And that theme of, of, of trying to, mm. in a sense, undermine democracy continues to this day. And I think what Ralph is really saying is that at the end of the day, the only weapon we have that could actually bring things forward is democracy. So we, we have to take democracy very seriously and push it as far as possible. Ralph, to, to come back to you, obviously, Mille in, in Argentina is a very different place, in a different circumstances, in a different context. But is that also, at the other end of the world, part of the same picture that you're talking about, that, that Frank Ferreira is talking about? I think so. And I think right, there's, what they share in common is kind of this idea of doing something new, even though some gradations are different. Now, about Mila in Argentina, what I think is really important 
is that he has realized it's not just the other parties or the parties in power. There is a permanent bureaucracy that is really what we have to overcome. Because this is also the problem for Wilders. This is the problem for Meloni. This is the problem for every quote unquote populist that comes into power, that there are many, many agencies that are entirely unaccountable to the electorate and they will just grind on it doesn't matter for them who's in power right there's this famous saying i think it was edgar hoover who said he doesn't care who's president under him and now we don't have one j edgar hoover we have like 10 100 j edgar hoovers you know every you know leader of an agency they pretty much can do what they want because they're not accountable to anyone so we'll need and i think this is where Mila goes in the right direction you need a quote unquote I'm being delivered the provocative, a purge of the bureaucracy, right? You need to kind of, you need to get certain people out if you want to do something new. It's not just the people on top, it's also the people along the line uh, down the entire bureaucratic institutions. And it, it is, the, it's ultimately always the responsibility of the of the people, is it not? I was very impressed by a line in, in a recent speech by Mele where he said that he hadn't come to guide lambs, but to awaken lions. And I think that kind of rhetoric is very, is very potent because people have to be reminded of their innate power as individuals and collectively, and it's manifest in democracy. It is, and I think you point to something because we have to be very careful. If we don't allow this quote unquote politics and their opinions and their views to have an impact in a democratic system, people will turn to really undemocratic politicians. We haven't seen a true fascist in Europe for decades. But I will not rule out that they will appear at some point. And then we'll see, you know, then you can really have the Mussolini-like figures, you know, the Hitler-like figures. And that will be a completely different ballgame. But those charismatic individuals do exist. So if we really want to avoid that from happening, we need to give these voices, as Dr. Freire has accurately described, the chance to speak within the democratic system, because otherwise they will look for representatives outside the democratic system. Absolutely. The, the demagogue is always there waiting for an opportunity. Ralph Schulhammer, as always, thank you so much for your insight. We'll speak again soon. Thank you. Another break, after which I'll be joined by the British former ruler and sometime Conservative Party candidate Alex Storey to discuss what this win may mean for the rest of Europe and indeed the world. Don't go anywhere. The most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. To join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, it, you? <laughs> it's my new teeth. your new teeth? It's, I, I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
exquisite. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. My next guest, Alex Storey, is perhaps best known to many for his role as part of the British men's rowing eight at the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta. Uh, but after that career, he turned to politics. He has stood as a Conservative candidate on more than one occasion. He now lives in Salzburg and, as well as working in finance, is a regular contributor to UK news publications. Alex joins me now. Alex, you've been listening to the conversation so far, yeah. the powerless state of democracy or not. Where do we go from here? What, what would you see as the way ahead? Well, the way I like to think about it, I like to think in, in frameworks, and I think the, the, um, your, your previous guest talked about the permanent bureaucracy. I think once we make observations and we pinpoint the problem, we have to, we have to focus on those. I think the first one is the permanent funding issue is something that we as citizens have to deal with. We have to find a, a way of um, definancing these organizations who have claimed for themselves a power that they've taken away from us, which is the power to regulate, the power to legislate whether on things, whether we like them or not. And the, the other thing is, is it, it leads to this power that they've got through that permanent financing is expediency. They no longer care about principles because principles act as a constraint and constraint is something that, um, the, the, that works against the plan that they might have. So that's the second point. The, th the third one is what we need to combat is this, this obvious double standard that, are, that has developed over the course of time. Most of us keep mentioning it. We keep saying that there is a double standard, but it points to something very, very, very deep. And that, in my view, is the creation of a caste system. And we see the caste system in full display. We had the, uh, the Commission on uh, Racial Equality uh, uh, you know, a year or so ago, which was actually a very good document that shows that at the bottom of the caste system that we've created in Britain, you have the poor white working man, a boy and girl. They are no longer relevant. And they're no longer relevant because what they represent is, is, a, uh, is, is a worldview that the permanent bureaucracy the permanently funded apparatus of the state has essentially rejected. Frank, I think you mentioned in your opening remarks the, the, the idea that the, the unit parties are zombified for want of ideology. And that seems to chime with what Alex is saying about, you know, an, an absence of principle. It is. They are running on empty. Yeah. And because they're running on empty, what they've done is they've created a network of institutions uh, which begin with, with non-governmental organizations who are very powerful. People don't realize how powerful they are. All the way to a, a variety of parastatal bodies who are not legally in a position that they should be, which they haven't got the authority of, of, of being accountable. All the way to international organizations. And so therefore what you've got is a, an institutional framework which offers a permanent excuse to any politician who can say, it's not my responsibility. I wasn't responsible for making this decision. It was this expert, this was this international organization. Or when you ask them, well, where did this policy come from? And, so it was, and they used the word, oh, it was our stakeholders, you know, who de determined. But the stakeholders are invariably pe people who are their mates, who they've kind of invited to become, you know, to brief them and, and to develop all these different policies. So this is a, a network that is uh, not based on ideology, it is based upon the fact that uh, they actually, well, they, they do believe one thing. The thing that they do believe in is that they're better than we are. Yeah. And they, they, they use the expression, that's, that's the giveaway expression, is we are here to raise awareness. Have you heard that expression? Yeah. We're raising your awareness. So the implication is we are the aware and you and I are idiots who need to have our awarenesses raised. And I think that that's, that sense of superiority 
is something that they call to me all the time, even though it's not based on anything substantial. Alex, to me, there's something crucial, actually, in the way in which populism and populist have become pejoratives. Mm. I, I see hope in that. I see that the whoever it is we're up against are, pl are plainly aware of and acknowledging the threat of the people. You know, they do see that with, say, with the PVV and with, with Mille in Argentina and with other populist groups rising across Europe, that, f that finally they may be confronting or confronted by a meaningful challenge. Well, I, I think there's, there's hope and there is, uh, there is danger because the, 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 um, the referendum in 2016 has been seen by this group of people um, as the last time that the people will be asked anything sensible <laughs> and serious. Uh, they have learned their lesson. And it's very much what I remember growing up think, uh, uh, learning, which I think is wrong. The, the, the view from the people who were for the League of Nations pre the, the, the Second World War and for the UN afterwards is that democracy was the source of war in Europe because that's the way that Adolf Hitler got, uh, came to power. So the idea that um, democracy is bad because of Adolf Hitler's rise to power was deeply ingrained in this anti-democratic uh, view of the world, which was people like Salter, uh, bureaucrats uh, uh, in the UK and in Belgium, uh, Jean Monnet and people like that who despised uh, democracy because it was a break on a new world which would be simplified and it was the recreation of a kind of of a uh, of Charlemagne's uh, Roman Empire or you know the the empire of the um, uh, 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 ninth century, and so what you have is, is is a group of people who have visions of grandeur. They want to rebuild Rome, and they see these pesky nationalists with their languages, their cultures, their religions as the break on their on their formidable vision of a, of a beautiful past. I just say that uh, there's a big lie here because Hitler didn't get elected. It wasn't democracy that got Hitler into power. In fact, at the very last election, he actually lost a lot of votes. It went, you know, went down all the time. So it was a coup d'état, something that was profoundly no, anti-democratic. Right. I'm, not, I'm not blaming no, democracy, but the, but the point but, I'm making is that this, the, the, what we have to, what we have to be, what we have to understand is that their power wants no challenge, and that that's the the important thing. And what what they see in us in these rebellions at the ballot box is a further reason to constrain democracy and to, to, to stultify it. Yeah. And so that, that's the, the danger is simply that um, they will pass to the, uh, um, the, to the permanent bureaucracy ever more powers and they'll defang parliaments increasingly that's right. in order to make sure that the only thing that a parliament is there for is just to when a, when a regulation is being passed so that the, po the, the popular, the, the, the people can sh tell us where the shoe pinch is, right? Which is, which is why they also hate the nation. They hate the democracy and the nation because a democracy can only function within a nation itself, which is why what they really like is federalism or, or a little empire. Uh, that's their big objective all the time. Mm. Alex, what do you make of the role of mass migration in this? Because I, I, as I've said earlier today and I've said before, I, what's happened it did not happen by itself. You know, this, this sudden change to the, to the demography that's been, that, that's, that's been imposed upon Europe, is, the, is, it, is that being used? Are these, um, uh, f the, the factionalising and the, and, the, and, the, and the hatreds between people, are they being exploited to, to compromise the power of the people? to stop any unity crystallising? Well, there, there, there are two things I'd say about that. There's, there's one which is the, the dumb mechanism of economic theory, and I'll go very quickly into this. It's, um, economists would say that growth comes from two things. One is productivity, and the other thing is uh, population growth. So that's the way that an economist looks at uh, where, the, the, where growth comes from, 50%. Uh, productivity, 50% population growth. Mm. Of course, on the 50%, which, first of all, in nature, nothing is equally split. So you can also already rubbish the theory, but it's very important to realize that it's completely embedded in the way that our governments see the origination of growth. So the first one is difficult because it requires education, it requires infrastructure, it requires strategy. But the other one, population growth. 
that's a lot easier. The only thing you need to do is to open the, the borders and forget about controlling them. What you want in order to, to have GDP growth going up is population growth. That's the easiest way to get that city number that is completely meaningless to go up. But it's really important for the political class because but, that's the way that happens. But at the very least done with scant consideration for the impact that but, it had but, on the people. But I'm going to, Alex, I'm going to have to go to a break. I'm sorry. purely run out of time. <laughs> thank you so much for that this <laughs> evening, though. Um, Alex Story, thank you for that. Coming up after the break, something completely different. I'll be chatting to a homeless charity about the problems that those in the streets face as the nights turn darker and colder. Don't go away. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's News Channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back once more. My final guest this evening, well, something of a Christmas angel. She's here to talk about what we can do to help those on the streets this winter. Imagine, if you will, being homeless, cold and hungry with no hope of a better future. Well, the charity Restart Lives is doing all it can and what it can to make those lives better for those people. A little bit of brightness. I'm joined now by Catherine Flay, the CEO of Restart Lives. Good evening. Thanks so much for having me. How did you get involved with this work? Um, so, it's a bit of a personal story in a way. My family, you know, we experienced some of the struggles that some people experience. We were never rough sleeping or anything like that. But I understand how some of the causes of homelessness can really affect a family and, and, and what can happen there. And I had experience working in another organisation with a linked charitable trust, so some of the sort of back-end knowledge of how a charity works was there. 
But that's what kind of drew me to the cause. And of course, I see so many people sleeping rough in London all the time, and I've been involved in volunteering. So it's kind of a, yeah, a mixture of reasons. What are you going to do? And what are you able to do in this run up to the festive season? Um, so we're doing, we're doing a lot for people who are stuck sleeping rough. So we can give away resources. We, we've just had one really big resources fair. We're doing another one in December. People who are stuck outside, we can give them shelter bags, sleeping bags, coats, other warm clothes, even, you know, emergency little brick phones so they can access emergency services if they need those. Um, but we'll also continue to do everything we can to get people off the street. So whether that's um, emergency referrals to hostels, to via Streetlink, some people will know about Streetlink, or whether that's just continuing working one-on-one -on -one to sustainably bring people out of homelessness into accommodation and supporting themselves, we'll, we'll keep going. Frank, it feels to me, I don't know about you, that it's just a forever problem, isn't it? It feels as though there will always be those figures that we walk past on the street and we, we're in the full knowledge that that's where they are living their lives on the street. Well, it does, but <clears throat> we mustn't give up because very often there are problems in society that just have been there forever and you look at it and you see well what the hell can can I do in this situation yeah. and the impulse very often is to switch off to look at your shoelaces to walk by and pretend this isn't really happening but if you do that we lose our soul we, we lose our sense of community and solidarity and for me uh, looking after the homeless is as, as much part of creating a community as looking after our neighbor or, or anybody else mm -hmm. so I think let's do it Amazing, yeah. Well, and what, you, you, I think you're doing a, a sleep out. We are doing a big sleep out, yeah. So 1st of December, it's a huge event. We're trying to raise awareness, first of all. So obviously, if you sleep on the streets for one night, which is what we'll be doing, which is what we're inviting people to do, you don't know what it's like to be homeless. No. But it's a little bit of a sense. This is what it's like to sleep on a street on a cold December night in London. Yes, you'll be going home and yes, we've got security guards, you know, it's a different environment, but it's a little bit of awareness raising and we're trying to raise vital funds as well. You're doing it? Yeah. How, and how many people do you think will be taking part? Um, maybe anywhere between, you know, 40 and 60 would be safe to take part. Yeah, we've closed a road. It's kind of at the back of Harrods. It's crazy. How, it, finding a solution to homelessness sounds like the labour of Sisyphus to me, because you know, there must be as many reasons to be homeless as there are homeless people. Yeah. Every single person must have a unique yeah. backstory. Yeah. How, do you, how, do you, how do you go about fixing for all of those unique individuals? It's, it sounds Herculean. It is hard, yeah. I can't deny that it's hard. And I think it depends. If, if there was a sort of... Um, there, there are different political models for how you might end homelessness. Other countries, like if you look at a country like Finland, they do housing first. So they say, we don't want anybody to be sleeping on the street. If we find someone who is sleeping on the street, they're offered a place indoors, just like that. In this country, we, we don't do that. And we know we have a social housing crisis. So charities like ours are left kind of trying to plug the gaps. We can't just magic a house out of nowhere. So that's not a solution. Um, so we try and work really one-to-one -one with people. We do a lot of one-to-one -one casework, which is where we'll sit down with somebody and talk to them about how have they found themselves in that situation and what do they perceive the barriers are to making progress in their life and supporting themselves again. And read in between the lines, what do we perceive those barriers as as well? And we make an individual plan with them. Is it getting better? In London now, are there more or fewer people on the street? There are more people on the street. So I think in the last 10 years, it's been a 54% increase in, in homelessness. Um, in the last year, it was around just over 10,000 people actually sleeping rough. And homelessness is a bigger definition than that. That's the worst, you know, the worst cases of homelessness. People might be sofa surfing. They might be staying with relatives, but who knows how long that can go on for. It's incredibly precarious. So legally, they're classed as homeless as well, and that number would be much greater. That is harrowing, isn't it? That it's getting more yeah. and more. As we, yeah. as we advance into the 21st century with everything yes. else that's going on, there are more people on the streets. Yes. Is, is that because there are more people coming into this country or is it because of economic problems faced by people living here in England? So I think, um, you know, Suella Braverman's comments, uh, one of the things she said is lots of these people in tents are, are foreign. 
um, we know that the majority of people sleep I'm going to have to I'm going to have to go to, to the, the out but thank you so much thank you I hope it all goes well thank for you thank you so much that's for having all, me that's all from me on Saturday night live thanks to all my guests now it's the Saturday five Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast. I'm Craig Snell. Well, tonight it's going to be another dry and cold and frosty one for most of us. A bit of a change out towards the west and that's all courtesy of this weather front. So that's just going to bring in some cloud and rain as the night goes on. But with high pressure generally in charge across much of the UK, clear skies is a perfect recipe for a widely frosty night across the UK. Still a bit of a breeze down the eastern seaboard, so here actually temperatures will just stay just above freeze. And then later on, as we start to see this cloud and rain move in, temperatures will recover uh, towards the west. So as we start Sunday morning, we could just see a few mist and freezing fog patches around, but uh, they will quickly clear. And we'll just start to see this area of cloud and rain just gradually spread its way a little bit further eastward. So sunshine turning increasingly hazy across many eastern areas, but staying largely dry here as the day goes on. Best of the sunshine up across parts of northern and eastern Scotland, but the far north actually just seeing a few outbreaks of rain. Temperatures in the west a little bit higher than they will be today, but uh, still on the cold side for the time of year. Into Monday, a bit of a grey, damp start across many parts of the UK. Some sunshine across western Scotland and Northern Ireland. That will spread its way a little bit further southwards as the day goes on, but still feeling fairly cold, and that cold theme will go... Who is it? We're here for the show! Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour, with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. Bellissima. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, it, you... <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's your new teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
It's Saturday night and this is the Saturday Five. I'm Darren Grimes along with Albie Ammon Corner, Benjamin Butterworth, Connor Tomlinson and a new voice on the show, the brilliant Lois McClatchy Miller. Tonight on the show, the 2016 revolt ain't over yet. Time to end the scourge of anti-Semitism. Mass migration is a betrayal of British people. Why do Gen Z want to ban the Bible? And why Britain needs to get building no matter what the moaners say. It's 7pm and this is the Saturday Five. Welcome to the Saturday Five, the very best Saturday night takeaway that you could possibly order. Expect fiery debates, spicy opinions and a huge topping of fun. Every 